On March 29, 2022, the Blasters of Ghana sealed qualification to the 2022 World Cup at the expense of the Super Eagles of Nigeria. We are at the headquarters of the Ghana Football Association to speak to a man who was with the team throughout their journey. Henry Asante Chum, the communications director of the Ghana Football Association, is my guest on Sports Check. And we are going to talk about the two games against Nigeria as well as the draw for the 2022 World Cup. Ghana have been pitted against Uruguay, South Korea and Portugal. We'll be previewing those games, his opinion and other issues on this edition of Sports Check. My name is Perez as well, Paul. And once we come back from this break, we start the conversation. Welcome back from the break. My guest today is Henry Asantitum of the Ghana Football Association. Henry, first of all, congrats uh, to you and the FA for qualifying to the World Cup. Thank you. Um, after the AFCON, we also were up in it was, it was a performance that everyone was proud of. There was a lot of pressure on the Ghana Football Association, especially the president, to qualify us for the World Cup. How big of an achievement is it for you guys to seal qualification to Qatar? Well, um, thank you once again. I think it's the dream of every um, leader of this football family to make it to, to the World Cup. Um, you realize that, yes, in the past we've struggled until 2006 when we qualified for our first World Cup in Germany. Um, it didn't end there. We made it to the um, South Africa 2010 World Cup and we made history by becoming the third African country to make it to the quarterfinals. Um, we were hoping to improve on that record in Brazil in 2014 things didn't go well. So um, in 2018, um, again, we couldn't make it at all to, to Russia. So there was always the need for us to put in measures to, to, to bounce back and to um, get back to where we belong and to be counted among the top 32 teams across the globe. Um, I'm sure that many Ghanaians had doubts on the back of our performance at the Cup of Nations in Cameroon, but we had um, belief and we kept faith in, in, in the setup that we put in place. Um, you remember that immediately after the AFCON, Milovan Raivac was relieved of his, his post as coach of the team. And, and the executive council took a firm decision on the, on the back of pressure from the public and, and other quarters that we needed uh, um, a particular candidate, or for that matter, a particular person to, to take over the reins of the team. But the executive council felt um, Otoado was the right man. Um, we, we took a decision to engage his club or his employers, which uh, for me, Dortmund were very professional in dealing with the FA. The FA president, Tony Buffo, and the technical director traveled to Germany to engage Dortmund on a number of occasions. Eventually, we landed our man. And I think that when you look back and you, 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 you look back at that decision, that moment when the ESCO took that decision, and today, and you reflect and you analyze, there is only one thing that you you will be proud of, and that is the fact that that decision um, has yielded the needed dividend. And today, we are in Qatar to play at the 2022 World Cup. Of course, there is some vindication for the FA with their decision to stick with the Tour because there was a lot of pressure to go for Chris Hewitt. Some even criticized the structure of the technical setup. So it's a huge achievement for the FA the council and your very self and everyone here, you know, for sticking to your grants and qualifying us. But what went into the decision to appoint a toward? What did you guys see? I've heard the FA president say two minutes into his meeting with him, he got convinced that Otuad was the right man for the job and the other coaches as well. What went into the decision to appoint a toward? Because it was, quote unquote, against the wish of the public, if I should say it that way. Well, we had worked with Otuado, um when he came in as an assistant coach during the era of Milovan Raivac. Um, he played a major role in putting the team together, in, in assembling the squad and in helping um, his former boss, Milovan Raivac. Um, Otto played four matches when he was assistant coach. Um, when we beat Zimbabwe 3-1 in Cape Coast, he was the assistant coach. We went to Harare to win 1-0. Uh, we played Ethiopia in, 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 in Johannesburg in South Africa. 1-1 it ended and then we played South Africa here in Cape Coast and we won 1-0. Uh, for which reason we qualified um, to the playoff zone. So we saw something unique in him. Um, his attention to detail, his attitude to work and the fact that he was 
um, committed to excellence made us believe that um, in that short time interval, if, if there was somebody who qualified to, to, to do the job, um, we, we, we couldn't have looked beyond Otoado. But today, when those people look back, I'm sure they will take back their words. You mentioned time, and it's one thing that we didn't have prior to those games because and we came off a very poor AFCON. We ranked changes in the technical department. Otoado Bele had six weeks. And Nigeria were playing good. I mean, based on what they displayed at the AFCON, what did Otoado and the technical team do? Because for me, I think their victory was down to the coaches we had. So what did they do within their period to, to turn the tie in our favor? They worked very hard. They worked tirelessly. They, 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 they showed leadership and they showed competence. There was leadership amongst the four coaches. And let me not take out Richard Kingston, who was already around. And there was competence that was on display. Um, I mean, once the appointment became official, we decided to um, you know, keep to um, our policy and our plan by not releasing a lot of information to the public. We knew they were working behind the scenes. We knew they were meeting physically and also on Zoom, um, looking at tactics, watching videos, looking at deployments, watching videos of our team, looking at the strength of the Black Stars and also that of the Super Eagles of Nigeria. They had to put you know, together a unique plan for the two games within that six-week period, and it wasn't easy. Um, I remember in one of the meetings that the president had with, with, with the technical team and the management committee, he mentioned that if there is God, then that God will reward them in the two matches. Because, you know, we couldn't imagine the, 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 the amount of investment that went into the preparation of the team. The, the amount of work that went into studying the opponent, into watching videos, individual videos of every single player wow. of, of the Nigerians. And it is not something they were doing, you know, um, individually. They all come together, sit together, watch videos, analyze, and share ideas. And that commitment is what, you know, um, um, we saw on the pitch. You know, you have followed the game a lot on I mean, decades of journalism experience. The second half of that game, for me, was interesting because it's one thing a coach realizing that we need changes. And it's another thing a coach having the guts and having the temerity to say, let me do it now. That, for me, that's, those decisions change the tie and ensure that what does that say about Otoado and his technical team? How important, from a journalistic perspective? Well, they, they are on top of their job. That's, that's, that's um, how I would describe it. I was on the bench with, with them um, through and through. Every second, the decisions they were making between Otto and, and George Burton and Didi Dramani, they always conferred to look at what um, could, could be the, the trump card for the team. Um, immediately after the blast of the whistle for the end of the first half, they, they had a mini conference on the pitch on even the before pitch. going wow. to the dressing room. And that was when they, take, they took the decision. I was standing behind them and I heard everything they discussed, okay. you know. So at that moment, they decided to switch to back five and back, and um, uh, five back anytime we defend, mm -hmm. and then five in the middle whenever we have, we have yeah. possession. So you realize that they brought on Andy Yadom, he replaced Ishahaku, then they shifted Dennis Odoi to the left to add to Gideon Mensah. So whenever Emmanuel Dennis has possession, he had two players going in for, for, for a tackle. And then they brought on Elisha Owusu for... Baba Idrisu. It's because Elisha is comfortable on the ball. And so once Elisha picks possession, um, Daniel Kofiche will move into space and he will lay a pass to him. And that's why Kofiche also came on for, for Jordan Ayu. And then in the, I think the last 10 minutes of the game, um, um, Afenajan had wear and tear because he was always jumping and going in for the hard tackles and running around, picking possession. So they also took him out and brought on Kwesi Oche with. And at some point, we needed somebody who would go in for tackles and destroy their attack once they build from, from behind. And Kudus does not have that ability. So Kudus is flamboyant on the ball, and then his shooting accuracy is also great. But at that moment, you didn't need his caliber on the pitch. So there was a need to bring in a different player. So they took off Mohamed Kudus. Kudus to the technical team for qualifying us to the World Cup. But We've won, our players were 
they had their shirts off, some of them were celebrating, then all of a sudden, chaos broke. We were in the stadium. I mean, tell us your experience. It was, it was, <laughs> it was frightening at some point. It was frightening when, you know, um, the Abuja Stadium is, is similar to the Rabai Eras Stadium. The only difference is that the inner perimeter in Kumase is um, a metal, so it's difficult to, to, to break through. And again, you cannot scale it easily. The, the length of the inner perimeter in Abuja is quite shorter than that of the Baba Yara Sports Stadium. So they ended up scaling that inner perimeter to come onto the pitch. Now, um, immediately after the blast of the final whistle, yes, our players were jubilating. Then we moved to the, the end where the Ghanaian supporters were to, to respond to the cheers. Um, then that was when the security... Um, coordinator for the game told us to all come to the middle or the center of the pitch because that was when they started hailing bottles and other um, objects at the team. So we all moved straight to the uh, center circle and we converged there for a few minutes. Then the man started counting us down that we should look at him and we should follow his instructions. Mm -hmm. At that time, some of the fans had started coming onto the pitch. They were scaling the inner perimeter to come onto the pitch. And it began to look scary. It was quite scary. So we followed the instructions of the security coordinator, and he started counting down from one to five. And immediately when he mentioned five, he asked all of us to rush through the tunnel. So we all rushed into the tunnel together. I think the, the last player was Thomas Party, And I think the, one of the fans hit him with a bottle um, at his um, um, right shoulder. But at that time, we had all moved into the tunnel. So as soon as we moved into the tunnel, we were ushered through to our dressing room. From the tunnel to our dressing room is about um, uh, 150 meters. But from the dressing room to the pitch is about two minutes walk. So as soon as we entered the dressing room, we locked the dressing room for security reasons. Sure. And that was when the jubilation started in the dressing room. So we did not even have any knowledge of what was happening oh, in terms of the vandalization and all the distraction and all that on the pitch until we finished and started seeing videos of the incident on social, on social media. But I read somewhere they had an experience, one of the Nigerian players, we are going to congratulate him or console him or whatever, then he took it wrongly. And it turned um, into some Shehu, scuffle. Shehu, Shehu Abdullah is a, he's not my friend anyway, because, um, but, but in Kumasi, when they were training, I was there and we had a chat and same in, in, in Nigeria. And I like his, his style of play. So when the referee blew his whistle for the end of proceedings and we started our jubilation, I saw him, you know, um, shedding tears. He was crestfallen. And as a good sportsman, I felt there was a need to just approach him sure. and, to, and to console him, pat him on the back. So I, I, I approached him, I went to him, his head was down, um, and, and he was weeping, actually, because it wasn't a good moment for, for, for them. So I tapped him and said, Shehu, better luck next time. I wish you the best of luck. I'm sure that your team is strong enough to bounce back in four years' time. I don't know how he took it. Maybe he misunderstood what I said. So he got up and rushed on me. Oh. But because I didn't want to quit a scene, I immediately left the scene. And so my players, I think Gideon Mensa and um, Mantari Kamahini and, and uh, Andy Adam tried to, to restrain him. And they did that. And later I saw Kudus as well. <laughs> Um, joining, the, joining the, the three of them. By that time, I had left the scene. <laughs> I was long gone, you know. I was long gone. But it's, it's one of those things. Um, it happens. I cannot blame him. Um, it, is, it, was, it was tough to take, you know, hard to, to, to take that, that uh, you know, moment of despair and, and disappointment. So I, I can understand. But it is not something that... I went there to tease him or to make him feel bad. I only went there to, to show goodwill by wishing him well um, for the future. <laughs> that, I don't know what I say. It's a funny experience or it's a strange one, but I mean, that I think it's, it reflects how 
you know, hurt the Nigerians were because yeah. they didn't expect that. Yeah. I think that based on one, our performance had the outcome, yeah. based on the result they had here, they In thought Kumasi. they were, they were yeah. gone. And, yeah, home and dry. And especially a 1-1 one -one draw was difficult to take. I'm sure that reaction is a perfect reflection of that. But we are going for a break. Once we come back, we will continue. We've qualified. The draw has been done. What's next for the Blasters? Welcome back from the break. My name is Perez Ezuakwa and it's Sports Check. We've been speaking to Henry Asante Chum of the Ghana Football Association. He's been telling us about his experience in Abuja, Nigeria. But now, we switch focus to the draw. We've been drawn against Portugal, Uruguay and South Korea. There are some familiar folks in there. Um, overall, what do you make of the draw? Did we have a fair draw or it's a difficult one? I think it's an interesting mix. Um... Uruguay two-time champions, Uruguay, um, they have a history <laughs> with Ghana. Um, I remember in 2006, before we played at the World Cup in Germany, we played South Korea. That team had Ji Sung Park and Co. Uh, we beat them by three goals to one in one of the friendly matches in Edinburgh, in, in Scotland. So, yes, our history with South Korea dates back to those days. Recently, the Black Meteors were in Japan and Korea as well for friendly matches. Yeah. Unfortunately, we were loaded in those two friendly matches. But that notwithstanding, I, I, I think they are a strong team from, from the Asian belt. They lost only one game during the qualifiers. They have um, an experienced side as well. They have a young manager who is, one, who is pushing to, to make a name for himself. Um, in their team, they are a blend of experienced players and upcoming players but they play for some of the top top teams across the globe in the german bundesliga yeah, sure. baba idrisu plays with one of them in raw mallorca um, in the spanish la liga and then they had they also have tottenham hospice um, song hu ming um, who is the the senior most player in the setup so the koreans are a very strong side portugal of course i mean um bernardo silva pepe cristiano ronaldo um, Fernandez, among others, a very experienced team as well. At least in the last two European Championships, they've won one, um, and they won it at the expense of host nation France in the previous um, um, encounter. So they also have a history with Ghana. You remember we met them in the 2014 yeah. World Cup, where they beat us by two goals to one um, in that in that tournament. Um, but we are also a force. Um, speaking of which. In 2006, we were the lowly ranked team in our, in our group, but we made it to the second round, same in 2010. Um, um, Serbia, we won against Serbia, we drew against Australia, and then uh, we lost to Germany, and we were able to progress to the next round, which we beat USA and also made it to the quarterfinal, where we lost to Uruguay on penalties. So we are a force. You know, right after the draw, there were Ghanaians started speculating that the desire to avenge what happened in 2010 should be a motivating factor for the Blasters to, when they come up against Uruguay. Would that not be a bit of pressure on the team? Well, fortunately, we will play Portugal and um, Korea before we play Uruguay. So um, by that time, I'm sure we, uh, we would know our fate in, in the group stages. I, I do not think that is going to bring any pressure whatsoever on the team. I, I believe, I believe. But, but do we think it's the right time for us to revenge for what happened in 2010? Or it's a normal game? I am sure, I'm sure that you're going to also be under pressure. I'm sure Luis Suarez himself will be under pressure because he's one of the few players who is still in the team who yeah. played in that tournament yeah. in, in 2010. So they will also be under pressure. They will, they will be thinking of, wow, is it? It's a completely new setup from Ghana because the only player who is, who is still around from, from the teams that we presented at these two competitions um, against Nigeria is Andre Ayew. Yeah. Jonathan Menton was in the team, but I don't know if he will make it to the World Cup. So it is only the captain who was part of that team. We have a completely new team at this moment. Players who have been played at the World Cup 
ever before who will be you know um, playing against the Uruguayan. So in as much as we would like we would want to avenge, they will also go out there thinking of um, um, putting up a good show against a giant from the African continent. So we will not be overawed. I'm sure we'll be prepared for the stage. I'm sure we'll be battle ready and we'll give them a good fight. My, la my last one on the World Cup though, how confident are you of our chances of making it after all the groups? The president has told us to go and make an impact. How confident are you of our chances based on I mean, the team and then the competition we are going to face in Group H? When it comes to playing at the World Cup, we are not a minnow. Maybe the only area where one may argue is the fact that this team is completely new. But it doesn't change anything. I don't believe that Thomas Pate is, is a minnow in football. Sure. Charging from what he does at Arsenal week in, week out, and what he was doing previously at Atletico Madrid. Um, Alexander Jiku plays against Neymar and Messi in the French League. Ah, so why would he falter at the World Cup? Because he is making his debut at the World Cup. We believe in these players. We know we have a competent squad. We know we, we have what it takes to, to make a huge impression and a good one at the, at, the, at the world stage. We have always encouraged our players that the best and the greatest opportunity ever is to wrap shoulders among the top teams in the world. And it couldn't have been um, any better playing against Portugal, playing against South Korea, playing against Uruguay. We will be battle ready for Qatar 2022. So we wrap up with discussions on the Blasters, but let's count a few personal issues. Also. But even before we get to the workout, there is a major decision, I mean, to be taken. That's the, the coaching. They had just the Nigeria game, then afterwards a major decision was going to be taken. What is happening with regards to the future of Coach Otwado and the other members of the technical team? Okay, so um, the appointment was for the two matches. Um, let's not forget that before we appointed them as interim coaches, we engaged their employers. Um, we spoke to Dortmund, we spoke to Aston Villa, and then we spoke to Nordjylland and Right to Dream for them to release um, Didi, Otto, and George. Um, Chris was unattached, so it was a matter of dealing with him and his lawyers to, to, to get a deal done. So now that the two games are over, I think we need to go back to the table and speak to the employers of these three coaches. Um, the executive council is yet to meet to take a firm decision, but um, whatever it is in terms of the future or the technical direction of the team, will be duly communicated once the executive council firms it up. Um, you, you first of all need to speak to the coaches and find out if they are raring and ready to go. Once that is done, then you need to engage their employers and ask for uh, them, put, ask for their release for, for the World Cup. Fortunately, the uh, European calendar, or for that matter, the various leagues would have ended at that time so it will not be too big a task for for their release but um, by virtue of respecting our relationship and respecting um, you know the agreement we had with them we need to go back to them sure. and speak to them and once that is done and we have that agreement in place a formal announcement will be made so there are no truths in report that Otuado is going to leave and Chris Hilton is going to take over as the head coach no no such decision has been taken by the executive council. Now, let me take you to an interesting angle of the whole company. It's got to the future of certain players who some Ghanaians feel should be part of the team. Some feel that the players who played in the qualifiers should be rewarded with places in the tournament itself. Others also feel that the likes of Mohamed Salis, who has no that Tarek Lamte and the like should be included in the squad. Now, let's do with each player. Let's come to Mohamed Salisu. What is the situation? What's the status of that? The engagement with him? I know the FA have been engaging with more firm. What was the status? Salisu is a Ghanaian. Salisu um, um, is qualified to play for Ghana. So it has nothing to do with where he plays, but if he is in form, if, if he is um, um, he's not injured, he qualifies to play for, for the Black Stars. But 
it is always the express decision of the coach. Yes, I can confirm that in the past we've made overtures. We've approached him on a number of occasions. CK did, Milo did. Yeah. But it doesn't change anything. I don't believe that Thomas Partey is, is a Milo in football. Sure. Charging from what he does at Arsenal week in, week out, and what he was doing previously at Atletico Madrid. Um, Alexander Jiku plays against Neymar and Messi in the French League. Ah, so why would he falter at the World Cup? Because he is making his debut at the World Cup. We believe in these players. We know we have a competent squad. We know we, we have what it takes to, to make a huge impression and a good one. At a, at, a, at a world stage. We have always encouraged our players that the best and the greatest opportunity ever is to wrap shoulders among the top teams in the world. And it couldn't have been um, any better playing against Portugal, playing against South Korea, playing against Uruguay. We will be battle ready for Qatar 2022. So we wrap up with discussions on the Blasters, but let's count a few personal issues as well. I mean, you've crossed from mainstream journalism to more of you're in the PR space right now. How difficult or easy has it been for you navigating um, this crossover? Well, obviously it's not easy. Um, but, but it is what it is. You, you cannot change the situation. Um, you need to respect, you need to develop the attitude of respecting people's opinions. Um, you do not um, you do not have to see them as enemies. You do not also need to um, describe them, quote-unquote, as them and us, or they and us. Um, in our part of the world, we, we seem to take offense when people are expressing their candid opinion or putting their, um, um, you know, um, opinions across. Now, you cannot always get or score 100% in any facet of this industry. Um, what we have done is to be accessible. What we have done is to project our, our, our products as much as possible. What we have done is to open our doors to the media as much as possible. But in all of these, there will be criticisms. And I don't think there is any problem whatsoever. My last question, do you think we can make tough for Amazing we because we are both Arsenal fans. Can we make tough for this season? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect this. Uh, I think I was a bit surprised when we lost to Crystal Palace. Yeah. I was shocked, actually. 27 minutes or so, we considered two goals. Um, and then later, 78 minutes, we considered a penalty and lost by three goals to now. There are 11 more matches to go. Um, I, I had a chat with Thomas the very day he returned from in the international break. Okay. And I wish my phone was here. I would have shown you the, the message he sent to me. He said, bro, the, we have 12 finals to play. 12. Those were his words. We have 12 finals to play. Unfortunately, Crystal Palace is over. It didn't end well, but there are 11 more games to play. Man United are in contention, Spurs are in contention, and Arsenal as well. We will see, but I am quite optimistic that we, we can make it to, to the top four. I mean, thank you very much, Harry Asante Chin. So we've been speaking to Mr. Hart. We've wrapped up on a whole lot of conversation. This is Sports Check, and to come your way with another edition of Home.